and take a good look at this because you're not going to see this too often. Maybe never again. Flight line. Truly never again, boys. It was so wonderful to be there in Keeneland to see Flight Line's last career race. Thank you for joining us. A special Blinkers Off. I'm not Jared. That's correct. Magic and Mike have taken over Blinkers Off. And it's special guest, Aaron Halteman, with us. Aaron, thank you for joining us today. I love that I'm a special guest on my own show. It, it feels different and weird. But, hey, I'll take it. We're all here. We've all survived. I agree with the Doc. What a weekend it was. Yeah, Mike, are you alive? Remember, everything I could remember was phenomenal. <laughs> yeah that's the that's the case uh if, if you didn't see us uh in downtown keeneland saturday night it's a good thing you're still that, that's probably why you're here because if you did see us then you never want anything to do with us again uh listen guys we're gonna put a little uh put a little ribbon on the breeders cup we're gonna go, we didn't really do a saturday recap show we figured uh we, we had some steam to go okay vent off and some celebrating to do so instead we're gonna do kind of go through some of the big replays from the weekend talk about what we saw uh, before we get into it, Aaron, just overall, aside from what a weekend, your takeaway from Breeders' Cup 22, what are going to be your lasting memories? Uh, well, flight line, right? I mean, that it's such an easy answer. It was just incredible. And I don't want to do all of that because we'll get into that in a second when we do the race. But I, I think the big takeaway, and it, it's funny you mentioned it because, you know, uh, Dr. Tang and I were talking about it earlier. So many people, so many different walks of life, all brought together by this thing called horse racing. And it seems like with horse racing fans, you're either way into it or you're not, right? And the people that are way into it, no matter who they are, what what walks of life they're from, they're all the best, best of friends when they get together. We had many friends coming into the Breeders' Cup that we saw again, and we made new friends. And I think that is what my biggest takeaway is going to be. We met so many nice people. We already knew a lot of nice people, and we saw them as well. I, it, it can't mean more to me than, I mean, I can't describe it, how, what it means to, to, to meet all these new people. So it was, it was great. That's what I'll take away from it. Mike. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this before. It is just phenomenal to play the live tournaments because of the people that you meet and you get to sit there and play with. And, and we had a couple of those that were with us this weekend that kind of got integrated in that racing dudes family for, for Saturday and Sunday, as we all played these tournaments together. And that was phenomenal. We were Friday and Saturday. It was great to see everybody or meet new people at the track as well. My, my main takeaway from a racetrack perspective outside of Flightline, which I'll obviously get into, Charlie Appleby is going to be the all-time Breeders' Cup leading trainer in less than <laughs> two years. I mean, it is it is obscene at this point. I believe it's right now it's, it's the coach at D.O. and Lucas at 20. Appleby's within striking distance to, to have the most wins within the next two years of the Breeders' Cups. And after watching his horses run this year, I, I don't see how he doesn't get it next year, if not the year after. It's hard to find a race where Charlie Appleby, even if he didn't win, where he didn't have horses showing up. And we'll talk about one of the or two of those horses uh, today, which will be a, a pretty good time. But and I think you guys encapsulated it perfectly. You know, it, it's crazy the, the different diverse groups of people we meet in horse racing and and who we get to be a part of and, and spend time with. And it was a lot of fun. If we saw you at Keeneland, we had so many fans who came up to us. were like, oh, we saw you on YouTube. We love your podcast. We love your content. That means more to us than, than anything. So when you guys come up and 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 show us the love and, and let us know that you know that you're out there making the money, you're betting the bets with us, you know that's really great. And and we love meeting each and every single one of you, including the guy I forget who it was, but he came up and introduced himself as our Toronto uh, <laughs> fan. And that one, uh, you ever want to see Aaron? Uh, what Aaron's poop in his pants face looks like? That's, <laughs> no, that's not true. I was getting ready to deck him. And then, it, and then he said, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I was like, okay, good. You you, you, you survive now. No, uh, you're right. You're right. When we were walking out, uh, a couple people from Springfield, Missouri, just right down the road. And well, actually, Jared lives in Springfield, just right down the road from me, stopped me. And it's just like, that was awesome. It was like, wow, like, there's not that many horse racing people in Missouri. And we found two. That's great. So, yeah, it, I agree. Yeah, it'd be great. All right, guys, let's get into it. We got the Breeders' Cup. Uh, five races, the Classic, the Turf, the Distaff, the Turf Mile, and the Juvenile that we're going to be uh, taking a look at. And you're going to get the expert opinions from Aaron and Mike now that we've had time to sit on this and think about it. Let's get into it, boys. Uh, wait, it's Blinkers Off. What do you guys say? Let's go! <laughs> Oops. I forgot where your – where is your little – It's okay. They don't do it in one take anyway. We could talk for like 10 minutes now, and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> the shade? A stupid, naive, silly little goose. That's me. I'm the stupid name. I feel like I'm being ganged up on. I don't like it. 
<laughs> well, you're a guest on your own show, so <laughs> <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, everybody in the chat, thanks for uh, for all the comments and uh, all the flight line talk. We're going to get into it. We're going to start with the classic here. So uh, I'm not going to have any sound here, but uh, let's. I'm trying to see if there's anybody, any comments to look at here. Oh, $1,000 double K Rock to flight line. Yeah, we'll talk about K Rock too. Yeah. That was a good one. And Hurricane oh, J. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love it. All right. Cool. Let's do this. Three, two, one. All right, guys, the first race that we're going to look at, the one that everybody cares the most about, the best race I've ever seen in my life, Flightline in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, I'm going to press play here on the replay. Aaron, take it away. As soon as they break from this, how are you feeling about Flightline? Uh, it's pretty amazing. I, I just watched him, and, okay, he's out of the gate. And then you see, look look who's is. Life is good. He's going right up there. Flightline's going to track. And I'm thinking, my God, I've seen this in my mind for two months now, and now it's finally – gonna happen this point right here though i'm a little worried i'm like no 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 flight line don't go up there and, and go head and head with him early and i know samich uh, though he kind of he, he relaxes right off of him yeah i mean it's like all right let's calm down here and you knew that was the plan for pratt here but i think he wanted them to go fast early i don't think he wanted to go too slowly on flight line because he wanted to really run the rest off their toes and take that late kick out of them and that's exactly what happened here because even if you look at like hot rod charlie and i know magic you asked me right after the race what happened to hot like Char hot rod charlie well, he went 110 for six furlongs. Hot Rod Charlie can't do that and finish a mile and a quarter race. And that's because of how fast they went up front. It was timed in 107. They reset that time to, to 109 on those six furlongs. Ten lengths off that, the second, second and a half back or two seconds back. You, these guys can't go that fast and finish as well. And, and Flightline can. He's just that good. It, it, it must be nice riding such a push button horse because I think you're right. I think Pratt said, all right, go up there and pressure him a little bit. Get him going. And now when I ask you to sit off, just sit right off. His flight line goes, okay. And then when I ask you to go again, just go ahead and go get him again. You're right. I don't cut him up, and then he went and got him. Pratt's about to do his look back here when he's two lengths behind. Life is good. <laughs> he knows how much horse he's sitting on. He's absolutely loaded at this point. Uh, it was just just phenomenal. And, and just to show how good flight line is, watch where life is good ends up. Like right here turning for home, I have a 1-7 exacta, and I'm feeling pretty good that the two is not running second in this race. I, you knew it. You knew he wasn't going to do it. You knew that it, it played out just like we thought. And it was never shade at life is good. It was just, I think Flightline will play these games and then blow by him, and then that'll be it. And you're right. Then it's just, a, okay, can Tabo or Olympiad, in this case, outfinish one another for that second spot? Yeah, I mean, it just absolutely flight line or life is good. Got engulfed right after he went that fast early. I thought he actually ran phenomenal. I, I just flight line pushed him a little more than he could take in those early stages in the race, which cost him toward the end. I wonder if they end up going closer to 111 if we see life is good holding on a lot longer and then possibly trying to stay up there for a second. But I don't, I think if they go 111, flight line's already five lengths ahead of life is good at that point. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I thought life was good. I think he deserves some credit. He laid it all on the line. He did what he does, right? And he turns for home, and he's trying to do that thing where he just kind of gets that kick away, and then and then it'll just be able to hold him off, and then there's just no kick away <laughs> whatsoever because this horse is just breathing down his neck. I heard an interview with Mike Smith after the after the race, a rider of Taba. He said, look, they're not supposed to be able to go that fast and just keep on going. He goes, he's in a different race. He's in a different class than the rest of this field. And we're talking about the best horses in the country that's in the field. You know, the, the, these are not claimers that he's beating. Yeah, it's interesting with the, the you know, the, the Mount Rushmore idea, right? The greatest ever talk that's happened after this race and kind of where you put uh, flight line in that conversation. He's not coming back for his five-year-old season, so we're not going to see flight line again. We've only got to see him on the track, I believe, it's six times. He's been phenomenal in those races. Um, it's The argument against it's interesting because if he comes back next year, who wants to run against this horse? Yeah. How often does he get dodged? If he, Let's say he runs five more times next year and it concludes in the Classic and he wins the Pegasus. He wins, let's say, the Whitney. He wins in Dubai. And, and then he comes back and wins the Classic. What more will we know about this horse considering who will face him in those spots? So it's an interesting conversation of like – could his legacy be grow even exponentially if he comes back for another year? Or has he really done everything he can? And we saw just a super horse just a few times just because of the soundness issues early in the career. Yeah, I know. It's pretty incredible. You, you wish you could see him again. Obviously not going to. But, yeah, it's, it, it is. It, and it's – you're right. You, you, saw, you talked about that look back from Pratt. So I was a half second away from looking at, you know, Jared and Magic and saying, hey, he's going to – he needs to go. He needs to go get him because he's still about two links back. And like you said – 
he took, he, I mean, it felt like three seconds. He was looking behind him and I was like, oh my God, we're going to see something just stupid. And we did. It was, it was just crazy. Uh, and, and like I said, the race for second was a really good one. And you would, you would identified Olympia as not getting enough respect. And it, you were proven right on that opinion. He ran a fantastic race. Yeah, I really messed up the betting of this race. <laughs> I, I was an absolute moron for not having any 471 and having a lot of 417. Uh, I probably should have had some the other way as well. The try pays $40, pays 80 to 1, $40 for 50 cents, 80 to 1, so 80 for a buck. Uh, not that tough to get to, especially considering that you had Flightline on top here and, and Taba, who I thought was a, a clear underneath choice. And then Olympiad was a surprise of the race. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, Olympiad, you know, it's just kind of the forgotten one. And, and we had talked about how all oh, these other horses, they're, you know, they're just going to try to run for second. Well, he did as well. And, you know, I think I think you could see right here. It's like everybody is saying, OK, just get back, try to make a run. Hopefully they come back to us, even though they pretty much knew it wasn't going to happen. And and yeah, O'Brien stayed around to watch this race. He said uh, leading up to the race, he said, I'm really excited just to watch him. You know, we, he said we, we we turn on the television when he runs. Uh, and, and we're all watching uh, overseas, and he says, I'm really excited to see him in person. So when guys like that say stuff like that, it, it's very impactful. You know, Bob Baffert, love him or hate him, he said before the race, look, we're running for second. Like, there, there's no beating this horse. And it, it was nice in a Breeders' Cup that had a lot of disappointments from big-time horses that it finishes with a race like this. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. It was nice that the superstar comes through at the end. And it, we talked about this race so much in the lead up to it, and it played out a, a lot how we talked about it. You have two separate races going on here. But for Flightline to win that way, to win by 10, and to hear the crowd just going absolutely nuts as this horse rolled home was, was phenomenal. There were certain races we watched on TV, certain we were on the front side, ones we were on the front side for. This is one of those that you had to be watching live and watching that by, by the track. And it was just a explosive performance and being there in person, getting to hear that crowd going crazy as flight lines started opening up was, was something. Yeah. Yeah. It got very loud for sure. And I think everybody knew what was coming and look, life is good. Did lose over in Dubai, but he was caught late and you know, it was like, yeah, he was just tired or whatever. He had never just been blown by like that at, at that point in the race. I mean, the it, you know, we were, we were barely into the stretch and he had just gotten blown by and it's like, when you think about how good that horse has looked throughout his entire career, I mean, that's just something that you, you just you just don't see very often or maybe ever, you know, from, from a horse like this. Even like think about Arrogant when he beat California Chrome in the Breeders' Cup Classic. It was a battle. It, you know, he almost lost. Like California Chrome gave him all he did, all he, all he wanted and just the final few strides, you know, he gets up and wins by a length. This was not even a contest. This was for top of the stretch best horses in this country and you knew he could pick the amount he wanted to win by i mean you just don't see it very often yeah wins the pacific classic by 19 open lengths wins here by 11 open lengths i mean just just dominant performance the closest anyone ever came to flight line in his career is going to be happy saver who was in six lengths of him in the met mile when he stumbled badly <laughs> and had to completely reroute uh just unbelievable six races that we got to see and now it's off to stud <laughs> And that's going to be interesting. I mean, this is a son of Tappet out of an Indi Indian Charlie Mare. Uh, like, should be a very good breeding horse as well. I mean, we've been, we've seen multiple Tappets have success as second careers as sires. I mean, this this could be fun to watch what Flightline's able to produce here in the next two, three years. Yes, 2.5% of this horse was sold today at auction for $4.6 million, folks. So uh, he's evaluated, uh, I, I guess I would mean $184 million is his worth right now. And if you're wondering, well, why isn't he going to race again? That's why. When you got a horse that valuable, you just can't do it. Insurance is not cheap. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other than the stretch when he turned and just started pulling away here, the loudest point of this entire race, I thought, for the crowd was when the second fraction came up at 45 and two. And we went, they went how fast for a mile and a quarter? And you did, and then right after that, when the crowd went, whoa. And then you saw Pratt do that the first time you looked back, and you're just like, okay. <laughs> yep. Couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Aaron, you guys were watching Pharaoh Zenyatta before my time. Uh -huh. Compare what you saw with Flightline in person to the greatest races you've seen in person. It's, I was gonna, I almost forgot it, Magic, and I'm really glad you brought it up. But I, I felt like I was back in 2015 during like the the the, the pre race. Uh, we they, we were we were at on top, kind of the third row of the grandstand there, 
and you look down the post parade and American Pharaoh wore a uh, saddle cloth for so did Flightline. And I, I we kind of was at that angle where we're kind of behind them and they're kind of walking away from us. And I, I swear to God, I was standing in almost the same place as I was in 2015. And it was like, wow, I'm having like this weird flashback. He <laughs> looked just like American Pharaoh. He had a, he had a blue shadow roll, just like American Pharaoh. I, it just like, wow, this is, this is him, you know? So anyway, it, it was, it was incredible to see that angle of him. And then like I said, th the way he ran, I mean, I, I think he was even better than American Pharaoh as far as the performance on the track, but incredible, incredible to kind of have that deja vu of, wow, this, this horse carries himself like American Pharaoh. We were watching him walk off the track. I was like, man, that, that's just him, man. It looks just like him. Mike, what about you? Where would you rank this race? Uh, this is an easy number one. I mean, I've seen a lot of great horses um, that, that have run in the past. I was at both Senyatas. She's a wonderful horse. Flightline would destroy her. Fly, just, just the way that we've seen some of these horses run. And so, like Pharaoh back in 15, Flightline would destroy him. I mean, eat him for lunch. And that might not be completely fair because Pharaoh was three, Flightline's four. So you have a year more of like maturation and development. But uh, I mean, it, it's it's to me pretty evident that this was the the best performance i've ever seen in my life best horses it's still really hard for me to say a horse that's only ran six times is the best horse i've ever seen in my life but definitely the best performance i've ever seen in my life yeah that's where i think i'll leave it as well uh, it just it's just breathtaking and made up for not being there in person to see the pacific classic so that's where we stand on that let us know what you think about the classic down below yeah we got fucking booted <laughs> that's never happened before what do you mean? meaning oh wait the stream's back up now this, this, Did we really? The, the stream went down. The stream's back up now. Really? That's yeah. weird. That was so weird. Sorry, everybody watching live. You guys were great in the chat because I saw that. I looked over at the feed in a different window and went, oh, yeah, they took us down. But we're back. So you know what? The podcast version and the version on the, the, the YouTube channel, it's all going to be intact. <laughs> That's at least recording. So why did we get booted? They didn't like that I kept playing the classic replay. <laughs> really? That's a first. Wow. So, but I stole it from the Breeders' Cup website. Not to end it. You know what? I'm going to uh, give me one second, guys, watching live. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up from their channel. And maybe if it's on their YouTube channel, maybe they'll be nicer about it. So, what did it, did it say? Like, it said something about the stream got suspended momentarily. Oh, wow. So yeah. I saw the people in the chat, it, and I thought something, like, had happened. Like, because I was like, what happened? And, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, oh, my God. So I got on Twitter. I was like, I don't see anything. <laughs> God. Okay. Well, I'm glad it's just us getting booted. Uh, here's a good question while we do this. Uh, Truth Exposed says she couldn't get over how big Flightland looks on TV. He's really that big in person. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He just, we talked about it when, uh, before, when we were, where we were at um, for the BCBC tournament, we were overlooking the paddock from the third floor and just how he was walking and carrying himself. He just, when people say horses carry themselves with class, it's just, you see that, like, I can't describe it. Just look at that. That's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was a massive horse to see in person. No doubt. I mean, just a big, big machine looking horse. uh sorry way, I'm, way to get I'm, us, just, I'm just get checking us, everything real quick way to get us shut down magic good job <laughs> it's always magic's fault come on why don't you want to work for me there we go yeah i liked magic uh admitted yeah i like <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> for the, the deposition was wonderful there uh, uh. How did he you run showing races live though? That's the difference. That was that's the weird part. How did he I look don't... compared to Zenyatta? I, I still think Zenyatta looked a little bigger in person, but big horse. Yeah, I mean the huge horse too. Flightline carried himself differently than Zenyatta carried herself though. I mean they both knew they were phenomenal horses, but Flightline looked like he was just he 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 knew he was a superstar, a super horse. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All okay. right, let's talk about the turf. This one, uh, hopefully doing it this way, it won't piss him off so much. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. All right, guys, let's take a look at the Breeders' Cup turf. We were very confident it would be a European horse. We were pretty confident it would be Charlie Appleby. Not sure how many of us were confident they would be Rebels Romance. I know Jared Welch, he was not here right now, but he actually did have Rebels Romance 
as his top pick. Uh, but let's first, before we dissect the race, let's talk about the two Applebee's and what happened beforehand, because Charlie Appleby had been asked Saturday morning which of the two, Nation's Pride or Rebel's Romance, he would uh, he would pick to win. And he said Nation's Pride. That horse ends up being the favorite. Rebel's Romance stays undefeated on the turf. So, Mike, when that happened, uh, when, when you started to realize after the race, like, wait a minute, <laughs> did Appleby tell us the truth or not? What's going through your head? Never trust a trainer. <laughs> That's what's going through my head all the time when I listen to this trainer speak because uh, Charlie Appleby known for, for being pretty – uh, fair when he talks about his horses. Usually you don't get any false information from him, and that's what made this really strange because he generally gives you a very good idea of what he thinks of his horses, which ones he thinks will fire, which ones he doesn't. Um, and he he liked he, he liked his other horse in this spot. He kept talking up, uh, or ta he kept talking down Rebels Romance. Didn't even mention this horse before it. So really interesting to see the odds flip uh, between these two as well and see Rebels Romance go off at a huge price or huge in contrast to what I was expecting at 5-1. to one. It just really odd to see a trainer specifically charlie appleby doing this before this type of race when he's got two in there yeah you know i had picked rebels romance and then i heard about this so like three people sent it to me either sunday morning or saturday morning or uh, friday or saturday yeah, morning yeah. saturday morning and, yeah and i thought well a there's there's nothing i can do about it now and b i'm just gonna trust what i handicapped and if it if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out because I just kept going back and back and back and forth over this. And and in and, and the end of the day, why I ended up putting Rebels Romance on top to begin with was he just looks like the best horse, period, you know? So, oh, and they're saying we're suspended again. But anyway, uh, he just looked like the best horse, period, again. And so I was just like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to play him. But it was pretty shocking to see. Yeah, I, I was I was surprised. I, I liked Rebels Romance more going into the weekend too, and so it was frustrating for me to. I took those comments a little too too uh, aggressively on my side because I moved Rebels Romance from, from first to third or from second to third in my picks. Um, and I, I guess I should have left him in second. He ran huge too here. I don't think what like you can have it lost on this is how big of a race this was. They weren't going that fast up front. He didn't get the perfect trip out there. He really just blew this field out of the water. And the, the three-horse Stone Age, who I like quite a bit here, tripped out, absolutely tripped out, and got destroyed by Rebels Romance. Yeah, I mean, it was I, it was crazy. It, it was the funny crazy. thing to me is that the uh, the race, the horses that we were all using in the, the pick five that ended up cashing from the wagering guide, if we had just boxed them in, in Superfecta and the Super High Five, we would have cleaned up very well in this. So uh, a race that I thought we all as a Racing Dudes team saw very well. We were uh, every horse that was that was a contender. We were very high on and just we got them in the right order for hitting the exact of the trifecta, that sort of thing. So uh, that's our thoughts on this one. Uh, clearly, the Europeans dominated the turf every race at Keeneland. It was a lot of fun. But uh, let us know what you thought about it down below in the comments section. We'll see you at the track. So I wonder if it's just like that. I, so I pull that down. Now let's see if, if they pull me back up, if they'll let me go back up again. Okay. <laughs> it's the damnedest thing. Like I'm showing even that it's like, I don't understand what the policy violation is when we've been doing this for so long. So It's NBC. It has the NBC logo on it. Yeah. You're showing the direct yeah. NBC replay. They're not, they're, that's why it's happening. Well, tell them to stop being such bitches. So... Um, Dylan says YouTube will ban you from live streaming if you keep getting struck down. Got it. Good to know. All so right. maybe Just throw up the time form and throw the the video in it for the actual. That's what we'll do. There you go. I would. I would just not do it at this point. <laughs> just yeah, that yeah, that that's, looks what good. that's what yeah yeah yeah. I mean, just throw that up and then we'll put the put the replay over it for the YouTube recap. But like, is that gonna get us get us in trouble as well, though? You know, if we do a re even if the replay is on, and so let's we'll figure it out after. Hey, we're back. We're back on. It's back. Are on. we back? We're back. They let us back on again. Oops, they let us back on again. So. All right, okay. what is the next race we're going to talk about? Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> I appreciate everybody sticking around. This is a. Uh... NBC, this is some real kind of bullshit, thanks to NBC. Um, we did Classic. We did the Turf. The Distaff is next. This will be... Oh, man. And this is the one where you really want that... Yeah, we're going to just have to describe it for everyone. I'll watch it from here. 
Uh, God bless. All right. Three, two. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me do. This would be so much better if it was a magic mic show. <laughs> yeah, really would. Very they wouldn't ban us on magic mic. They're like, do all the replays you want, boys. Yeah. All right. <laughs> three, two, one. All right, guys, the Breeders' Cup just after me. The, I don't think anybody would argue the best finish of the entire weekend. Uh, at every step of the way, you thought it was blue stripe. Maybe Claire is gaining and Malathat at the wire. Uh, a reverse from what we saw in last year's Breeders' Cup just after. But, Aaron, I'll go to you first. This finish, what was your initial reaction? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this was a, an unbelievable finish to the race. Malathat. You just really never felt like she was going to get there, but you never felt like she was completely out of it. And it's like, oh, this is going to be the most Malathot loss ever if she loses this race because it feels like she's supposed to win it. Um, Clary Air saving all the ground. You, you thought that horse was going to win for a minute. And you're right. You thought Blue Stripe was as well for a little bit. I mean, it, it, it was just a, a three horses that I didn't really feel like really wanted to go up there and do it. And then Malathot's able to get the nose down. From a from a finish perspective, this was probably the best race of the weekend. Yeah, phenomenal finish. I probably would have made Malathat 20 to 1 midway down the stretch because I'd seen her lose this race at least five times in the last 10 tries of hers because she just seemed like she was going to hang again. And Clarier looked like she was just rolling up the rail and going to be the horse that gets the blue stripe. Malathat somehow gets her nose down in the final, I don't know, maybe one thirty-second of a mile when she actually surges by these two, gets her nose down on the wire just at the right time, wins a very tight photo. It was a lot closer than it looked uh, in real time. I thought Malathat won easy real time in the photo. She got a, a, a uh, blue stripe, got a decent bob there and almost out bobbed her. Uh, but hey, good for Malathat. Wish she would have done it last year instead of this year, but uh, we were still happy she was able to get the job done. What? was going on with nest in that ride guys i mean that's the one the, the one takeaway like, you never see irad do this but man i don't think nest ever had a shot in this race because of how wide she was on the first turn and just the, the overall trip she ended, she ended up getting here horrible horrible ride i mean and for no reason that's the thing sometimes you get forced wide and it's like well he got he got forced wide and that, that is what it is you had horses the inside of you no, it was a terrible ride. I, he, 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 don't put this one on the on the record books there, uh, Irad. That was that was bad. Uh, I, I don't know what he was doing on her. I don't know why we we hung her out so wide for so long. That's the thing. If you get wide into the first turn, well, then try to save ground into the second turn. And another thing, why was she so far back? This horse was like, I mean, like Secret Oath was ahead of this horse. The horse was seventh down the backside. This was horrific. Maybe she didn't show up with like her A race, you know, but this was bad. This was a really bad ride. And, and I, she had no chance. It doesn't feel like you got to see whether or not she showed up with her A race. It felt like you just was kind of, you just throw your hands up. If you had Nest, who was unfortunately the, the favorite in this spot around three to two, you just, you have no idea whether or not you had the right horse or not, just because of the, how they played out. You mentioned Secret Oath. I mean, this was an interesting race in my mind, just because you had so many different points of this race, you felt like certain horses could win. When Secret Oath made that move on the turn, I'm like, oh, is this, are we finally going to see Secret Oath show up here? Especially because we knew Nest was basically just spinning her wheels at that point. And then you have Blue Stripe come up, and it looked like this was Blue Stripe's race for a good portion of the stretch until Clary Air and Malathat showed up right toward the end. Well, I'll tell you this. I think if Secret Oath hadn't ran in 30 million races this year, she would have won because I think she turned for home with, with her mind on business thinking, I'm going to win this thing. And I think that just wall of race after race after race from her finally got – I mean, not finally. She'd been looking tired for a while, but – just got to her, you know, and she just couldn't finish the race. She looked like a million bucks for a long time. And that's, well, not a long time, but for a little bit of time there in the stretch and just couldn't, couldn't finish. But yeah, uh, look, I, I think you have to give credit for Malathot. The last three races here this season, she really kind of turned a corner and was able to find a way to finish her races much, much better. And she was able to do it one more time here. What a battle! And, and what a re I, I really give give Steve Asmussen a good uh, a, a good amount of credit for Clarier. Got her back. You know, not the ideal circumstances coming into this race. You know, the disaster up at Saratoga and couldn't get a race. Finally gets here and she ran her race. She almost got there. Yeah, I think this is a great example, too, for anyone who asks, like, hey, why do some people add blinkers to horses that aren't necessarily speed horses or want to be forwardly placed? Malathat 
the addition of blinkers three back made all the difference in the world for this horse. You saw her one race with blinkers, kind of get used to it. The second and third and fourth starts have been phenomenal with blinkers. And that that is what I believe made the difference of why she didn't hang again here and it was able to get the job done. Yep. I, I definitely agree. It, it's made a big difference for her. And like I said, this did feel like it was going to be the hang job of all hang jobs, but uh, she, you know, <laughs> give her credit. She was able to get it done. And you know, the difference between us being on here and just saying, my goodness, is a nose, right? <laughs> She's a nose away from us going, oh, what a hang job. What a and terrible it's like, hang oh, job, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and said, oh, you're the distaff winner. Great job, you know. Well, the, I will say the good news is uh, it, it, we're not going to see all of these horses return blue stripes just sold for $4 million after this race. So a uh, nice little, I guess, consolation prize for missing win and distaff by a nose. Malathat expected to retire, not official yet, but... Clarier, Nest, and Secret Oath, and Society all expected to come back next year, which means this older distaff division could be taken off again. Secret Oath was entered in the sale, and they decided, nope, we're going to pull her out and run her again at age four. So Nest, Secret Oath, Society, let's keep it going at age four. Let us know what you think about the distaff and the horses in the comments below. We'll see you at the track. Hey, we didn't get kicked off that time. Good job, boys. Four million for her, and then Blue Stripe, her older sister, went for five million. So there you go. That that dam is going to be coming to America pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Secret All right. Oath needs a break. I hope if she's coming back. So wait. they both are. Let's see. Nest isn't coming back until April or May, and it sounds like Secret Oath will probably do the about the same thing. I would say Apple Blossom, maybe Secret Oath. And that would that's be probably great. yeah. Can we yeah. switch the barn on Secret Oath? Can we? Can we gotta keep it with Lucas. I'm not gonna comment, but that 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 ownership group's not moving barns. I know okay. that much. But <laughs> listen, yeah. it, it is what it is. You want them to run a lot, and it's it's fun to, for the stars to run. But at the same time, did you really have to go to the cotillion? Maybe maybe give her a little break right there where she's fresh for this race. You know what I mean? Like little things like that. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to run once a month. We'll we'll take eight races in a year happily. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. Uh, there is no more Mo Donegal. He retired. He is a he's a stallion, so he's not coming back. Uh yeah. Here we go. We get to talk about modern games. Yeah. yeah. All right. Three, three, two, one. All right, guys, let's talk about one of our favorite horses in training right now. Modern Games shows up, and hey, we get to make the joke again. We got to cash the bet on modern games this year. He wins the Breeders' Cup mile. Aaron, I'll go to you first. At what point did you know modern games has got this? We're finally going to cash a bet on him. Ooh, not very much uh, of the race. <laughs> and I think that because he was way behind. And he, then when he swung for, for, for home, he was so wide. But about mid stretch, I started yelling. And Samish can confirm. I started yelling, the big horse is coming. And boy, did he ever. He, he came with a big flurry there at the end. And once, like I said, once he got going and I could tell, okay, he's got his footing and he, he's, he's you know, straightening it out now and it's going to be fine. I knew he was going to win, but it took till about mid-stretch before I was real confident. Because let's face it, him and Ken Ross both, they did not get the easiest of trips in here and they really came flying home late. Yeah, I thought well, Ken Ross yeah, was the best Ken horse. Ross. I thought Ken Ross, Ken Ross was the best horse in this race based on the trip he got and the move that he made and how far outside he was. And just the entire race never got to say the lick of ground. Um, and it was making a monster move on the outside down the lane. It was never going to get to Modern Games because Modern Games got a better trip. And Modern Games' trip wasn't great, but got a better trip and got the jump on him. Um, I, I, it's one of those where I picked Ken Ross before the Breeders' Cup. And I, I, it was so frustrating to see that 13 post pop up because I wanted to stay with Ken Ross. And then you get 9-1 to one on the race day. And the, the trip just – it's tough. Any, every double-digit horse at Keeneland had a difficult time this entire weekend – that's one of the stories of the weekend, just how hard it was to make trips from the outside. There's a lot of times we could say, boy, the post got that horse beat. I'm with you, Samich. I think this is this is one of those times because here's the difference. They both were very wide on that on that far turn, but Modern Games saved a lot of ground from that from his more of an inside of the post, where, like you just said, Kinross was not able to save as much from that 13 hole. That probably made the difference. I think those two were the two best horses. In the race, uh, and Cheryl Spite, who's just a Keeneland, you know, specialist, was able to sneak up there and get second and knock me out of a huge straight exacta, which was kind of another story of the Breeders' Cup running. If I need an exacta, I'm going to run one three. If I need a try, I'm going to run one two four, and that's kind of how that went. 
Yeah, that was a cold exacta for me too, and that one did not feel great when it was Cheryl Spite, who's the size and fifty-six to one is the horse that gets you. One that I never even considered, and I probably wouldn't consider again if they ran the race five more times. I mean, it's just not a horse that I, I was going to use in this spot with some of these horses that were coming over. A little disappointed in a couple in here. I thought Pogo ran pretty well, being so close to the pace. We didn't see a lot of turf speed hold on going two turns at all in any of these races. Really disappointed in Dream Loper. I, I don't know what happened there. I, I thought with the, the post coming out of the three hole, Dream Loper should be able to run a big race. Had good position and just backed up something fierce here. Just didn't fire. Yeah. Just did not fire at all. Same with Annapolis. Got way behind. Didn't get that trip that he got last time out over that Keeneland course. Got the complete opposite trip. I, I never even saw him. And then I heard the announcer call him at 11th. I said he'll have no shot from there. Uh, Regal Gloria, horse we kind of thought might sneak up and run better at a decent price. Nothing from her. And I think the whole theme of the weekend, except for the sprint, obviously, when it comes uh, to the turf races, th the American horses just weren't good enough. These horses yeah. showed up and ran huge. All credit in the world is Cheryl Spike. Now, that, that one ran fantastic. But look, Ken Ross was third. You know, Ivar, kind of a over here based horse, but then Malathath, and then Order of Australia, then Pogo. I mean, even the also rands were a little bit better than some of our top ones. Yeah. Well, hats, I, hats off. Go ahead, Mike. We just dominated all weekend on turf. And even in the sprints, like, yeah, there's one turf sprint where we had a Car Caravel wins at 42 to 1. The other one, three of the top four Europeans, the two year old turf sprint. So it's it's not even like the turf sprint was this this dominant performance. Now, that one, I would argue, it's a lot of post position dependence there because there were three outside speed horses that, that destroyed that field. And it was just a, a, a collapse type race, which you don't see often going five and a half on the turf. See, that's another race where maybe the top contenders weren't drawn to the outside, but because of the way it was drawn, the race unfolded a certain way. Right. Yep. Because the speed all to the outside and they all had the same mindset of, well, we're outside speed. We just got to go. And then all of a sudden it's it's like a free for all when you turn for home. Yeah, they go 21 and change. The inside speed is then ends up behind a wall of horses, doesn't respond well. And it, it's all about the collapse horses at that point. Yep. Hats off to trainer Roger Atfield, not only to get Cheryl Spite to almost win at 55 to 1, but earlier than the day, Lady Spite Spear in the Philly Mare Turf got third and she was a bomb as well. So uh, good to see him showing up. Uh, a great trainer up north at Woodbine. And let us know what you thought about the mile. So many great horses, so many ways you could have gone. I see some people in the chat loaded up on Cheryl Spite and we're able to hit that exacto. So congrats to you if you did. Let us know what you thought in the comments. We'll see you at the track. All right. That was good. Whoops. Uh, juvenile was, do you remember which race? It was race, race nine race on nine. Friday. Okay. Well, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> we, uh, oh, man, we've, this, this has been a, we an adventure. <laughs> it's like Mike said, if this was Magic Mike, it would have been no problem. <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. The feature event on Friday, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, always a good portention for the Kentucky Derby the next year. And we might have our, we definitely have our early favorite for it here in Forte, not the one that we thought was going to be the champion coming out of this. Aaron, I'll go to you first. We were all he had very heavy on Cave Rock every single bet that we had going. I don't know there's really much he could have done differently here. He just, he ran a little bit of a pace setup and uh, got beat. This was the one I was most disappointed in all weekend. And you might say, well, he still got second and, you know, Golden Pal and Jackie's Warrior, they, they ran worse. Maybe they did, but Cave Rock looked pretty shitty in this race. And, and again, I know it's it's he got second in, in a grade one and it's the juvenile, but I didn't think he ever looked that good in this race. Did you, Samich? Looks like an immature horse to me, like a two-year-old, right? I mean, that because yeah. Cave Rock should have rated. I don't know why they have first, first, first here across the board either. I it didn't. I, I mean, I felt like Hurricane Jay had the lead on him around the turn, at least the first turn. And he was forced three wide almost in that first turn. So I, it felt like Cave Rock should have just settled behind Hurricane Jay. And when you go 22 and four and then into a 47 half and you're three wide on the first turn and pressing there, you're going to get tired. And so it, to me, this is one of those spots where like, look, Cave Rock, needed to decide hey i'm gonna let hurricane jay go and i'm gonna just try and trounce this horse pull a, a flight line type trip right if you're that good you got to be able to do it and he's just not mentally there yet he could easily get there next year but he's just not mentally there yet as a two-year-old running this early in his career um and that that got him you could tell he was clearly more tired down the lane than he ever had been he didn't switch leads at all until very late in the race so you could just see that the immaturity on the cave rock side when he was faced with a tough trip and in this case it was simply 
you're not easily the fastest horse out of the gate, which he has been in every other race of this. I, I was so, so mad at myself because I love, I, I mean, we, we both did so much. We both loved Forte in that race at Keeneland and such a good effort. And I, I did everything straight cave rock with Forte or cave rock with national treasure, you know, and just like, I had Forte in stuff, but not in the top spot, like an idiot, not even one little saver on this horse, you know? So I was really frustrated. And it was one of those days and magic talked about, he's like, if you just would have like boxed your bets and still, instead of going straight, he would have cleaned house, but it's hard to box a bet when you're using a one to two shot, you know, so you can't do it. So anyway, yeah, it was, it was frustrating. I, I hated, and, and it probably comes from what you're saying. He's immature and he was just more tired than normal. He didn't change his leads. He just, he, he, he ran up the backside, even like he was almost like he was, I don't know. It's like tightened knots almost. Just just didn't look smooth. And I was just like, uh, even when he turned for home and he put away, you know, uh, Hurricane Jay and he, he'd kind of put in away uh, National Treasure, I still thought, yeah, you're probably going to get beat. You're, you're kind of walking. And then you saw you scale back and quickly you're like, oh, he has no shot because Forte made a massive move. I thought he ran a fantastic race in the spot. Yeah, Forte was like a freight train around that turn. When you were looking back, it was one horse moving. Everyone else was pretty much going up and down, and that one horse that was coming was Forte. Um, improved a little bit off of his his previous race, the Breeders' Cup Futurity, from a numbers perspective. Uh, Cave Rock and National Treasure both regressed off that Santa Anita Derby race, which is something we probably have to start looking at now that we've seen multiple West Coast horses regress when they've come east. Uh, but for last year for the Derby, obviously, with Table and Messier, and now Cave Rock and National Treasure struggling with the same thing here. So that at least has to be something in the back of your mind is a better now with these horses. See what happens with the with the Baffert contingent this year in the Derby, because we know they aren't going to be Bafferts, right? So we got to figure out where they're going, where these horses end up. Man, Forte looked great, though. And this, to me, and I, I you know, I don't want to take away from Forte, because I think Forte was phenomenal in this race. I got even yeah. more excited about Loggins after this race, because I thought Loggins yes. ran a better yeah. race maturity than Forte did. And then Forte comes back and does this. So yep. um, I think we have a really fun derby season this year. I think we're going to have a lot of different directions you can go. We haven't seen the Florida horses come into the question yet. This was, I guarantee you, this was a better Breeders' Cup juvenile than last year. Like the, the top three horses will most likely all be in the Derby and possibly the top four. Yeah. As long as they stay healthy, I totally agree with that. I think it's much better. And Greg makes the point. He said, I, I went with Forte after I saw him, Greg, he's one of the prettiest horses I saw the, the, in those two days. This horse does not look like a two-year-old. He is massive. He knows. And you, you, you went on to say he carried himself. He knows he's good. And he definitely, I was, he looked great at Keeneland that day. And we only saw him on the screen. I'm saying, but he, if you remember, I was saying, oh my gosh, he looks amazing. And then you see him in person. It's like, yeah, he is a big beast of a horse, but you know what? Cave Rock is a pretty nice looking horse too in the flesh. Um, so yeah, but Forte, wow. He ran to the looks. Let's put it that way. What did the super pay here, Magic? You scroll down a little down bit. Just, yeah. Just out of curiosity. Cause I want to know how hard I should kick myself. Yeah. That was everybody's top four. I mean, so it, it paid that 10 cent super paid 13. So 130 to one for Forte Cave Rock National Treasure Blazing Sevens. And it like, you could probably just key Blazing Sevens in fourth two there and get 137 to one. That's crazy. 134 to one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's put a bow was, on this. I'm sorry. sorry I was going to say this. We'll just put a bow on this and, and yeah. say we're looking at the Kentucky Derby now. This is the, the other than Corniche, the horse that wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile traditionally always at least makes the gate for the Kentucky Derby. Uh, are we on logins? I know that was brought up. Are we thinking Forte, maybe Arabian Knight, the two-year-old that we saw run his ass off for Bob Baffert? That's uh, tough right now. I will say this. Lord uh, Forkway brought up in the chat 10 to 1 on uh, Forte in the Derby. I wouldn't take 10 to 1 on anybody in the Derby right now. It's just way too far out for my my taste and the way that we've seen horses not make it into the Derby gate. I, would, I, I wouldn't consider anyone sub 40 to 1 right now. Um, and which normally means you're taking out most of the top contenders from this race. Um, as, as far as the best horse, the best race I still think is what Cave Rock did out at Santa Anita. I'm not sure I can play him now, though. I'm sorry, Delmar, but I'm not sure I can play him in the like I can say that he should be the Derby favorite. I think there's a, a group of five or six that you could really make an argument around. Yeah, I, I agree with that. David brought up Arabian Night. I mean, that horse looked awfully good as well. It was just the first race. It was just a one-turn race. So for, for the Derby purposes, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what he does when he stretches out. Uh, I, I want to mention what Truth Exposed says here. It says both Cave Rock and Forte are built like they're already three. So that's important to note. 
because they could be early developers and what's going to happen when the other horses start to kind of develop uh, to their level uh, when we get closer to the Derby, that's going to be a big key as well. So no, back, back to, I want to, I want to reiterate what Samich just said. Don't take anybody at 10 to one right now. Don't do it. I mean, if you can get a, a flyer on something, go ahead, but it is way too early to take uh, you know, what I believe is 10 to one, still a short price for a race that's going to be run in May. So don't do it right now. If I if I bet any horse in the Derby right now out of this race, it would be National Treasure. Who the, the ten post was a brutal trip for him. Was three or four wide on the first turn. Tried really hard on the back stretch. Went too early. Just got too tired down the lane. I, I, I would he would be the one who Baffert has said is five months mentally developmental behind Cape Rock at this point. He'd be the one that I'd be interested in. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's definitely one that could uh you know do exactly what i was kind of trying to say is like maybe could develop you know the the horses that are good right now are not always the horses that are good come may we've seen it some years that they'll they'll hold that form and some years those horses that we're talking about right now they're nowhere to be found so that is a question that's going to start to get answered come january february march and, and on into april and you know we're just getting started racing dudes where you're home for the kentucky derby season so make sure you come back here Subscribe to youtube.com slash racing dudes for all the Kentucky Derby coverage leading up to the first Saturday of May in 2023. Hit like on the video, subscribe to our channel. We'll see you at the track. Sweet. There's the horse I'm excited about too. Extra and Yeho. Yeah. There, there are so many good two-year-olds that we saw or what looked to be very promising two-year-olds that we saw this fall. Like it, this is significantly better than last year's class at this time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, I, and I think that's the key. There's a lot of horses that are that are just coming on the scene right now or might come on the scene. You know, this Churchill Downs meet coming up is big. This Del Mar yep. meet coming up is big for those horses. They're going to jump on the Derby Trail. So be a little patient okay. and, uh, you know, we'll meet back in a month and, and we'll know more. And then even even more a month later after that. We probably haven't seen Pletcher's yeah. best, yet, best yet either. I mean, oh, I guess he has Forte, doesn't he? So you, maybe we can't make that argument. But he normally debuts his best in Florida in December, yeah. and that's when we start to see those horses run into the Derby Trail as well. So I would expect we're going to see this class get even stronger. Uh, let me make a quick comment before we go here on Echo again. Curtis Mantle brings up that Aspuson Sun said Echo again is the best horse he's ever been on. Now, that doesn't mean everything because Aspuson's son hasn't only been riding for a couple of years. Well, I think it's, this is his second year maybe that he's riding maybe second or third. I don't know about exercise riding, but anyway, <laughs> but echo again, specifically, let's not forget when he debuted at Saratoga, he was all the rage. Aspuson was glowing. They tried him at two turns and he was bad. He was actually entered in a one turn sprint at, at uh, 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 Churchill a couple weeks ago. They had a, a horse fall on the, on the, like on the front side and they couldn't finish the race. They had to call off the race, but in that, in that race, Echo again turned for home with a big lead and, and it looked like he was going to gallop out of there and, and dominate and they couldn't finish the race. So anyway, they called it off, but it looked like he was going to get his second career win in that start. Don't forget about him. I think he's going to be uh, a pretty solid horse. No, that's what I meant. I meant two turns. I meant two turns, but I meant, yeah, it was Dennis. I, I I screwed up what I said. I meant I was trying. My point was I was trying to say he didn't go back to a one turn race. He went another two turn race is what I meant. And yeah, so that in that first turn, a horse fell and a jockey was down, and they couldn't they couldn't get the jockey up in time for them to finish out the race. They thought that was going to be very dangerous, so they called it off. But anyway, my point: he was turning for home, and he looked like a monster. And then they had to pull him up. I got to say, like one of my takeaways from the weekend, I'm really pissed that Gunite wasn't in the sprint. I think Gunite wins the sprint by like open lengths based on the way that all went down. I think they kept him out because of Jackie's Warrior. And I like, and then for Jackie's Warrior to throw, I mean, it didn't break wonderfully. It doesn't get the lead, can't get by anybody down the lane. I, like Gunite wins that race by open lengths, right? Yep. I mean, it's just, yep. ah, put Gunite in there. Why are you going the mile? I, I, I was going to pick it. I was going to pick him. Well, obviously, first, I had Jack Christopher on top. And, yep, guys, you're not going to convince me he wouldn't have won. He he would have won, I think. And then yep. Gunite was going to be my pick. But then Gunite goes to the mile, and we all sat here and said it. That that's not the right race for him. Go back, you know, and anyway, it, it sucks. But 
uh, that's another race where I love to leap power, but had him in second on everything like an idiot. So, yeah, I, it, I've never had a Breeders' Cup like this where my handicapping was fine and my betting was atrocious. So bad. Yeah, it was rough. It was a fun the weekend thing. from the, the, the straight exact bets. So you mentioned I had three straight exactties <clears throat> that ran one, three or one or two, three. And it's just like, all right, you know. Not 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 my day in that front. It, it, we both hit the late pick five on Saturday, which is a little bit of a saver, but still yeah. not nearly enough to kind of make it a great weekend in that front. Um, uh, it, it was it was a tough betting side of it, and that's that's the thing because it was you're always right or very close to right, but never dead on, and, and you need to be dead on with the style that, that we normally attack bets. Yeah, and so Greg, I had a leap power on the multis, so we like like Mike yeah. just said, we were able to cash yeah. the multis and kind of you know. I'm not going to say it was a great weekend, but kind of salvaged the weekend. But as far as an exacta, I didn't, I, I played it straight. It's dumb. This one, I had a cyber knife, Cody's wish. And it came in Cody's wish, cyber knife. Just stupid, stupid. I still betting. can't believe that one. I thought cyber knife I, was going to pull away and win by about two. And when oh, he took over. Dude. I had everything pressed and single through cyber knife. So that was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's just whew, it's just crazy. And like, oh, so so I had a, I was in a contest. Like John White had a contest with uh, it, it was four or five people, and all it was was pick your top two horses basically for each race, and, and whoever gets the most points wins. I won because I always had. I, I mean, I, every every race I had them, but I I put them in the wrong order. I didn't bet them correctly. It was just. Ah, crazy, crazy weekend. I'm but. glad you explained because you paused. You're like, I won. And you just paused. And I'm like, do you want a cookie? Like, we know you won. What are you expecting? <laughs> no. I mean, I just. When am I, when am I getting my Casamigos bottles, Magic? Ah, uh, you should have cashed in when we were in Keeneland. That was your chance. <laughs> and that's the there was thing, a like, bottle. You know what? When we were doing cleanup, we found a bottle. You should have just taken that one. Why? That's another thing. Like, first of all, you guys need to do that a week later next year because a lot of horses quit. Like, didn't didn't come a, like two days after you did the show. Like, they announced now they're not coming. Yeah, yeah. I only had eight. All right, and I still to beat them. That's true. Yeah, good job. Final final takeaways. Uh, it, it, we're heading to the seat. Like, I guess now that the Breeders' Cup is done, what are you looking forward to next? Or are we just gonna relax for a while until Malibu? What What's next for horse racing, Aaron? What's next for horse racing? Well, I'll be honest. The next couple of weeks aren't fantastic. However, Del Mar is starting, even though even though there's not like stakes racing, that's still a really, it's turned into a really good meet. We had a really good meet over the summer at Del Mar. I hope they continue that momentum because those are great cards. Churchill's going to be running. Aqueduct's going to be running. So there's really good racing. But the next big uh, weekend is definitely Thanksgiving weekend. It's fantastic. Uh, Thanksgiving weekend, all four days are really, really good. And then the Cigar Mile is the next uh, weekend as well at Aqueduct. So actually, uh, last weekend in November, first weekend yep. in December, the action's really good. And then the Malibu kind of on the day after Christmas as well. The, the, the turf action on, on Thanksgiving weekend, yes. especially at Del Mar, is, is just incredible. Yeah. Mike? And you, you forgot my favorite meet. I get to go back to the Champions Meet. I, I love the Champions Meet at Gulfstream, too. It's really sure. funny they call it the Champions Meet, and they're running 12-5 claimers. But I love the Champions Meet at Gulfstream because you get to start – you get Brown and you get Pletcher down there. You get the, the Ortizes down there. You get a bunch of the New York uh, trainers and jockeys down there, and you get some of the, the better debuts from two-year-olds that you get to see down there as well. Uh, I find that a really bettable meet. I'm – Still excited. I know one of the few people. I love betting that synthetic track because I think it's very easy to handicap. So I'm excited to get back down for the Champions Meet down at Gulfstream and start uh, doing some bombs from down there. We had our, our two Racing Dudes tournaments, the final two tournaments leading into the championship, and we had a ton of you participate. We had a ton of qualifiers, some people double qualifying. So uh, if you did, congratulations. I'm sure Jared will be reaching out to you about that. But then we've got that to look forward to on Malibu Day. So Thank you to everybody who participated in the tournaments. I hope you had fun Friday and Saturday. We had over 50 of you each time, so this thing is growing. That's a great sign, so we hope you had a lot of fun. And uh, there we go. Scott, you described uh, – yeah. Aaron described Scott's Breeders' Cup perfectly. Right horses, wrong order. You know what? I will say I feel much better when it's that than it was just we just had no effing clue all weekend what was happening because – we're there. We just need a little bit of that horse racing luck that we talk about sometimes. But we had plenty of horse racing luck with all of you who are following us through the Breeders' Cup leading up to it. 
Please stick with us. The Kentucky Derby. If you thought the Breeders' Cup was fun, just wait for the Derby Trail to get going. The conspiracy theories come out of the, every single corner of the woodwork, and we we absolutely love it. So uh, thank you for joining us. For Aaron Haltzman, Mike Somich, I'm Magic. For Jared Welch, who is, uh, I think, still recovering a little bit. He did have to do all the driving this weekend. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back. Uh, both of us will be back on Thursday. Magic Mike Show will be live Thursday with a pick five sequence from somewhere fun. And then Blinkers Off will be back. And then you can get all of Jared's thoughts about the Breeders' Cup. Until then, take care, everybody.